Ein Migre. Quieres? When I was fresh out of high school, I believe in my first year of college, this would have been around 2013 or so, I had gotten a kind of big boy job at working help desk for a popular theater chain that I don't want to mention by name because that job was kind of trash. But the fun fact or the fun bit of that job was actually at that job I went to lunch one day and that's the time when I got the idea for the app that would eventually lead to the development of Mechanics GG. In case you guys don't know, I don't just build guitars. I have my full-time job, I, my best friend and I, we have a software startup. We're building this awesome platform called Mechanics GG. And the idea for Mechanics GG came off of the back of another idea that I had while I was working that dead-end job. And I wanted to buy a Les Paul. I thought that the Les Paul Tobacco Burst was just the coolest thing ever. And I found one used at Guitar Center at around $1,500. And it was a pretty good deal. I think it was like a, uh, it wasn't a studio. I, I knew I was really big on the binding. I wanted to have binding on my guitar and it had like this tobacco burst. I wasn't the biggest fan of the uh, cherry burst, but I really like the tobacco burst. Now the cherry burst has grown on me, but again, I'm rambling. Anyway, found this guitar at Guitar Center, was gonna go buy it. And at that time, my family was vacationing in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And I didn't get to go on that because that job that I was working didn't allow me to take time off, which kind of sucked. So I missed out on a family vacation. But I remember calling my mom and my dad before I went there and I was talking about like, hey, I'm gonna go pick up this guitar. And I was seeking reassurance naturally because I knew I was making a terrible financial decision. And like the wise people that my parents were, they said, hey, you should probably save your money. And so I didn't end up buying a guitar. Um, and I was a little bit disappointed, but in reality, now here we are almost 10 years later, and I have this awesome CNC machine and I build guitars now. And the coolest thing is, is that I get to build a guitar. I get to build that same Les Paul, but I'm gonna build it to my specifications. I'm not just gonna take whatever Gibson was gonna give me at the time. And given the time that it was made and current Gibson QC issues, I'm not trying to throw shade or anything like that, but maybe it's a little bit better than now later down the road when I've I'm still working on financial stability, by the way. Financial stability is a relative term, but I now have the means to build a guitar, my take on that same tobacco burst Les Paul that I wanted to get all those years ago, but now it is my guitar. It's not Gibson's guitar, it's a mad lad, almost A's for true signature, but it is the way that I want to build it. I've modified the design to my specifications and add some things that I think would be really, really awesome. So I get to build my guitar and that's what we're going to do today. So we are building Drew's guitar or Drew's Les Paul today. So we're gonna take this big old hunk of a knee gray, this body blank, in case you didn't know, all Mad Lad guitars for now have a knee gray bodies. A knee gray is a beautiful, beautiful wood from South America. It's very similar in feel to like a mahogany, but it's not as dark, but it does have some really nice spalting and some figuring on it. So you can get some really, really good finished products out of it, or you can do some really cool things with finishing and stuff like that. And the grain pattern really lends itself well to some really, really beautiful designs. So this blank is probably about six to eight pounds and Les Pauls are notorious for being super duper heavy because they are made out of mahogany, usually with a maple top. And mahogany and maple are both very heavy woods. So I'm going to carve this down on the CNC machine. You're gonna see it all go through and Presto Changeo will have a blank here in just a couple minutes. So now the stuff that you guys came for, let's cue that time-lapse.
Hey, yo, look at what we got here. So, take my headphones off here really quickly. <clears throat> I am very happy. I am very happy. With how this burst came out. This is pretty much exactly what I saw in my head. This could not have gotten any better in my opinion. So, two passes of each, the yellow burst and the sort of brown yellow burst, the yellow pigment or the yellow stain. And then after that, a little bit of this brown to feather out on the edge. You saw in the time lapse how I kind of used the detail brush and feathered it out. Pretty standard stuff. The It makes it a lot quicker to finish guitars. There's way better ways to do it and way more colorful ways that you can do it. If you want to take a look at how that's done, check out the PRS Private Sock again. I <laughs> can't sing their praises enough, but for the most of the reason that Gibson's and a lot of other Les Paul style guitars have this kind of, they call it a teardrop finish, is because it's really easy to spray and it's really quick to spray. It doesn't take a whole lot of training to train somebody to just kind of feather around the edges or go over it with two passes of light and then this. I'm slowly building my way up. Remember, this is a process for searching for the, for the perfect finish, keyword there being searching and that implying that it's an iterative process that I'm going to continue to build on it. But again, I am super duper thrilled with how this came out. And now we're gonna get to the part that everybody loves. We're going to do the peel. By the way, if you are watching this is the build video for this particular yeah. guitar, there is a, if you wanna see more about how I actually finished this guitar, you can check out the video Searching for the Perfect Stain Part 2. I have a series going on where I look and I'm trying to recreate some of the best stains out there. Really learning how to stain and finish guitars as the pros do. And so this guitar was featured on that second episode. And you can go check that out up here in the link in the description. But I didn't go too, too much into it here. I just kind of did the time lapse because that's what you guys come to see is just the, the process, I guess you can, or sorry, the, uh, the time lapse, because that's more entertaining to watch. But if you're wanting to learn how to actually spray and stain guitars, I'm not an expert, by the way. That series is all about me learning the process of like staining and finishing guitars. So I sometimes speak from a platform where I seem like an expert at certain things, but I'm not. So I still have plenty, plenty to learn when it comes to finishing guitars. And oh my goodness, this came out perfect. I've been thinking about also, there's, since it is a little bit bigger, there are some guitars out there that have like a chamfered edge. A chamfer is basically like an angled edge. So if like this part on the top here is angled up and then you can tape that off and that acts as kind of a natural binding around the border. It's a little bit more modern looking. I would have to modify the files and see if I could machine that on, given my current machining capabilities. But for right now, I'm really, 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 really pleased with this. Now there are some imperfections it looks like, but this is all going to get worked down and finishing. So I'm probably gonna hit this with 600. I use a progressive scan sanding schedule, by the way. So 600, 1000, 1200, 1500, and 2000 grit with layers of clear coats in between. So I'm probably gonna hit this with 600, trying not to like break up the color or anything. Cause remember, if you even if you're using 600, 600 is still kind of in that danger zone where you can, if you rub too hard, you can still go through the finish. And since there's no clear on this, it can get really, really monka when it's trying to finish it. But um, I think I can knock down some of these like little particles and imperfections and then get some clear coats on it and the clear coat will all even it out. So super duper plays with that. This guy is gonna go to clear coat. And then I also have to carve the neck and the fretboard. So you guys have seen me do clear coat before, so I'll probably do clear coat off camera. But next step I think would probably be just getting the neck going. So. Let's carve a neck. Got it again with those real cozy CNC hours. Alrighty, you guys seem to really enjoy the time lapses and I enjoy watching them as well. So be sure to leave a comment down below if you enjoy the time lapse. So as you can see, we're carving out the top part of the neck here. We've got the truss rod channel and we're doing the headstock. I want to say that I had a clip of doing the back carve too, but I might have lost it or just didn't take it. This is one of my first videos doing a uh, slab to strings full build documentary. So. I missed a couple parts, but I'm learning, so I hope you'll bear with me. And once the operation is finished on the CNC machine, you're left with this, the neck basically stuck inside the blank. And we have to cut it out, and the way that you do that is just with the regular old handsaw, so going back to basics. The CNC machine will actually leave some tabs on the workpiece, and then you just have to cut those tabs out and sand them down, and you have your neck. And speaking of sanding, now it is time to begin the 
long and tedious but somewhat therapeutic process of sanding. I actually really enjoy sanding and as you can see I do a mix of using a random orbital sander as well as doing some hand sanding usually around the contours and the curved parts of the neck. The hand sanding works a lot better. And then we get to the fretboard and the first thing that I do is I cut out the inlays and this is going to be kind of a basic dot inlay but we or I should say I I use we a lot but I but also we <laughs> sorry I have an existential crisis here I do these kind of long pill shaped sort of looking inlays and they get progressively longer the further you go down the fretboard I thought of it and it's like this is somewhere there's a happy medium between a dot and those bar inlays and as I'm going across it or the operation basically goes do the inlay, set the epoxy, and then come back and go over the top and actually radius the fretboard, and that's what I'm doing here. But I ran into a little bit of a problem, which you're gonna hear about right... All right, happy accident moment 600, or 69,420, we'll go with that. This is a collet. It is a special screw down sort of thing that you use to fix the bit to the router. You basically tighten it up and it squishes in on the router bit and make sure that the spindle or the router spins it and that there's good contact between the cutting edge and then the spindle, which is actually spinning it. So it doesn't like shake out or stuff like that. The thing is though, if you don't tighten this down, sorry, I sound really angry. I'm not, I'm just like, this is kind of funny. <laughs> this is one of those mistakes. Always check. This was not tightened down in the time lapse that you were just watching and that's why it didn't cut. So I've tightened it and let's run it back. Alrighty, here we go again, but we're not going to be here for too long because another problem crops up. Wait for it. Alrighty, so the time lapse is finished and we've got this. So, you guys probably saw in the time lapse that as it was going over, or as I was carving the radius, I didn't carve the inlays deep enough, and so all that epoxy just get got vacuumed up or cut right off by the end mill. And the reason that that happened is just having to do with the thickness. I didn't set the stock thickness correctly in Fusion 360 when I designed the CAM program. And so it's always the Z-index. They say uh, corners and doors is where they get you. But uh, in machining, it's always your Z-index. So. Needless to say, I got my thickness right. Machinists will know what I'm talking about on that last statement, by the way, but if you have no idea what I'm talking about, just I didn't have the thickness set correctly. But I fixed it and I made this new beautiful fretboard, which I'm going to go ahead and glue up here. But also I think this was kind of a happy accident because I saw a video from another luthier who was doing his great guitar build off. I'm gonna put his name down below, so sorry, I can't remember right now, but Great call out, he was doing a carbon fiber neck, which is a really cool prospect to me. Maybe I'll have to work with some carbon fiber later down the road, but he created it to where his overlays or his inlays basically overstretched the edge of the fretboard. So if you carve into it, and then when you lay down the epoxy and then you carve out the edge of it, since you already cut over the edge and there's epoxy in there, when you cut it away, you automatically get fret dots. And there's some, it's kind of hard to see with the yellow epoxy here, and I could have got a little bit deeper here. So I'm gonna keep refining that technique, but that just takes one more step out of the manufacturing cycle. I don't have to drill side holes or uh, side dot inlays anymore. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, so we have our neck, it's nice and sanded down. I've also taped off the back because I'm about to glue the fretboard to the neck and then I'm gonna stain it afterwards. And there's some debate as to the order of operations for this one. On the Ging guitar, I stained the neck first and then I put the fretboard on. But on this one, I'm gonna put the fretboard on and then do the stain after that. It's really just dependent on the fact that I need to go and get some more clear coat. So I could have stained this, but I don't have the clear coat. I need to drop by the store and get some. So we're gonna glue this up. I've taped off the back just so if there's a little bit of glue run off it that won't get into the back grain or the nicely smooth contour on the back of the neck. And so I'm gonna put some glue down, get this clamped up, and I will see you once the glue is dry. Oakley dokely, glue up is finished. However, we did have a little bit of bleed on the left side here, but for the most part, the tape kept everything pretty clean. Now you'll notice there's a little bit of a lip around the edge. 
And I can't tell if that's intentional or unintentional. It might be a dimensional thing in Fusion 360 that I have to check on. But I digress. We can sand this back using my tabletop sander, oscillating sander. So we're going to do that and get everything kind of shimmed up. All right, next thing is next. We've got everything sanded up and smoothed over and now we get to tape the other side. So fretboard is taped off. We are going to stain the rest of this neck to finish match against the body. And I think it's gonna look pretty good. So let's get spraying. Yo, look at how shiny and gorgeous and gorgeous and shiny. This next shine is like more shiny than my Riz in high school. Not saying that I peaked or anything. My Riz has only gotten better, but uh, Riz now versus Riz high school Andrew. <clears throat> I don't know where I'm going with this joke. Point is this thing is real, real shiny. Finished it up, I've sanded it up through 600 grit and then laid down a couple coats and it is smooth. When we polish this up, it's gonna get even, even tidier. So really, really excited with how this one came out. It's also finished match to the body, which I'll bring over in just a second. We're gonna actually pair these up and mate them. We're actually gonna put this guitar on ice for a little bit, which by the way, putting it on ice, what that means is I basically put the guitar into um, my media room slash studio for about seven days or so, just we made them up and then put them in the, the air conditioning and everything. That allows the finish time to cure because you don't want to polish, even though it looks dry and everything like that, dried and cured are two different things. So a finish can be dry, but not cured. Cured basically means that the water content of the finish evaporates off and it's just pure poly. It's like a candy shell almost, if you ever look at like the outside of an M&M shell. So all the water, evaporates off and then it's just hard shell polyurethane and that's what we want that's what you want to polish if it has water content and stuff like that it's still kind of squishy and prone to not solidify i guess you could say or when you actually go to polish it you can mix up the the stain and it starts to get cloudy and it just doesn't set correctly and the the finish is somewhat compromised not that it wouldn't like keep the guitar safe and stuff like that but it's just not the most ideal way to to, to uh, polish the guitar. Sorry, I'm pontificating now, telling you guys about the different ways that you uh, can finish a guitar. What cure. But long story short, we have to let the guitar cure for about a week, uh, seven days. That allows the water to completely evaporate off and we get left with that nice polyurethane coat. But before that, it's your favorite time. We gotta do a peel. Gotta peel off this rosewood. I have been waiting multiple days. Y'all just have to wait like a couple seconds or you can fast forward in the video, but I have to wait like a couple days or whatever between coats and sanding and stuff like that to get the peel going. So this is as exciting for me as it is for you, I think. So take that little edge off there. <laughs> Let me know down in the comments, give this peel a rating. So we're off to a good start. It's kind of like, I mean, opening up a Christmas present almost like, you know how when you open up a Christmas present, you always rip like that one big shred down the middle so you can know what it is. And then you start slowly ripping away and stuff like that. That's basically what we're doing here. So, oh, uh, this rosewood popping next to this sunset finish. This is gorgeous. So, peel it on back, peel it on back, peel it on back. Just strip by strip as best I can. And we're also gonna finish this fretboard a little bit as well. There's some product that I'm gonna put on it here in a second, but Holy moly, the inlays actually pop. I was worried that the inlays, the inlays when they were against the actual like maple didn't look as good, but now with like the yellow behind it, it really does pop. So we're gonna make it pop even more here in just a second, but that is simply gorgeous. I just can't think of another word to describe it. 
So it looks like there are some still machining marks up here on the top. I might have to work those out, but also when we actually treat the fretboard, which is what we're about to do, it could help that as well. So treating the fretboard, we have to seal the fretboard in the same way that we do the back, but instead of using poly, you have to remember that the fretboard is one of the things that you interface with the most on the guitar. And don't worry, by the way, up here at the nut slot, um, there's a little bit mixing, missing. So you're like, oh, why is that first fret so short? It's just because I machined off a little bit, but I'm going to repair that. We'll do that in a second. Um, or you guys will see that a little bit later. But the fretboard is the part that you interface with the most on the guitar. And so you, the feel of the fretboard is one of the things that you're going to, the feel of the neck and the feel of the fretboard, especially are the two things that you're going to hear guitar players like critique the most usually because this is, like I said, the interface of the instrument. So you're gonna work with the neck the most out of all the other parts. So if we put poly on this, it tends to have a sticky kind of glossy feel and some players like that, um, but the vast majority of them don't. You kind of want the fretboard to have a natural kind of porous feel almost, um, to have it be a little bit grainy. I don't know how to describe it, but guitar players, you know what I'm talking about. Like you want the, the fretboard to not be too glossy or too like finished over. You want it to have like a natural feel so you can like grip and fret correctly. So with that in mind, we're not gonna seal this with poly. Instead, we're going to use a two-tone, the super combo, of boiled binseed oil and weeb dryer. What are boiled binseed oil and weeb dryer? I will tell you, check this out. All right, behold, boiled binseed oil and weeb dryer. Now some people might actually see boiled linseed oil right here and Japan dryer, but your boy, the mad lad of them all, the weeb of them all, sees things a little bit differently. I bet you do too. So I'm gonna have to make a little modification here really quickly. So one second, I'm gonna just do that. Turn these into B emojis. Make that a B. There we go. Boiled bin seed boil. Boiled bin seed oil. Yeah, boiled bin seed oil. So two Bs, and then I'm not gonna tr even try and like rewrite over this. So let me get some tape real quick. Um, yeah, here we go. All right. A little bit of this. Cut it in half. All right, you already know. So shout out to Clean Strip. If you guys are watching, because I know all 16 million of you guys that are watching right now, there's gotta be a Clean Strip employee somewhere in there. I'm trying to pick up a scholarship, or not Bro. a scholarship, I finished school, I don't need a scholarship, but I'm trying to pick up a sponsorship. So if y'all wanna do a limited run of boiled binseed oil and weeb dryer, just know that I will peddle that every single day. So, you know, everybody's trying to get those crazy, crazy good sponsorships. Everybody wants the gamer subs and the NordVPN like sponsors and everything. But your boy trying to pick up a clean strip <laughs> sponsorship. So clean strip, if you're watching and you're interested at all in influencer marketing so that I can shill your product to a bunch of mad lads out on the internet, let me know. So boiled binseed oil in Japan dryer. The way that those works, boiled linseed oil or binseed oil. I'm just going to call it boiled linseed oil. You guys know the meme. So boiled linseed oil is a sealant. It is traditionally, it's been used as far back as hundreds of years ago on violins as a varnish component for violins. Um, boiled linseed oil and varnish, I think are a little bit different, but point is this is an organic kind of compound. It's linseed oil. So you take linseed, you crush it up, and then you boil it to boil off the impurities and stuff like that. And you get a very, very natural sealant. This naturally protects the fretboard against wood and other, <clears throat> not against wood, but against moisture and other stuff. But because it's not a chemical compound or it's an organic compound, it tends to work with the wood a little bit better and react a little bit better. So you still have a very natural feel. You don't have chemicals like filling in the pores of the wood and stuff like that. They kind of absorb and homologan, homologanize. Is that, is that even a word? Homologanize? Yeah, they become homologous and they kind of even out and all that good stuff. Now, Japan Dryer. Japan Dryer is another compound. I don't know exactly what is in it, but you can mix this with boiled linseed oil to make the linseed oil set a little bit easier. Normally, linseed oil takes about six to seven days or even a couple weeks to set, but Japan Dryer allows it to dry a lot quicker and evaporate more quickly so that you can turn it around. Also, when you put the boiled linseed oil down, you're gonna see that the grain is gonna start to pop because we're gonna let all the moisture or all the linseed oil is gonna sink into those pores 
and fill them in with a little bit of color and so everything's gonna pop a little bit. So I think, by the way, I got this recipe from Highline Guitars. So this is a little trick from Highline Guitars. I believe the ratio is four parts boiled in seed oil to just a little bit of Japan dryer, maybe not even the full part, like half a part. So I'm gonna get a little container, mix it all up. We're gonna apply it to the fretboard and see if it pops. So let's do that. Oh, by the way, another, this is actually an exclusive A's for Drew Luthier tip. So we, my family eats a lot. <laughs> my family eats a lot of nuts. Uh, pause. But so trail mix, trail mix and nut mixtures and stuff like that. And they come in these little containers. So here are these. And I always have my pops save these because these are great for around the shop. You can use them to store stuff. Like I have in my sanding drawer. I literally use these for sanding discs. So. With that in mind, you can use the cap or the top from one of these to be a little mixing thing. Some people like to use a little boat and stuff like that, but with how little I'm going to be making here, I'm just going to do it in here. And then from here, I can just dump it in there. You don't want to use like trays or stuff that you're going to use for food and stuff like that, because even though I think if you sanitize it, there's probably still residues and stuff like that. And you don't necessarily want to be ingesting these, even in small amounts. So that actually brings me to my second part. Make sure that you're doing this in a well-ventilated area, wear your respirator, and wear gloves. I'm going to put on some gloves here in a second. This stuff is irritating to the skin. Um, it might also help to have like a lab coat or some sort of splash so that it doesn't get on your clothes and stuff like that. Again, they're organic. Um, at least boiled linseed oil is an organic compound, but I'm not so sure about Japan dryer and stuff like that. So better that it doesn't get on your clothes and on your skin and cause it to be irritated and stuff like that. So I'm going to mix up the ratio right here. I'm going to get a damp cloth and just wipe it in. We'll see how this looks. I really hope the camera captured it, but if it didn't, this wood literally just popped. Like you put, like I said, you put the mixture on there and then all of this was like subdued. This in right here, this kind of caramel, like, I don't know, it reminds me of iced coffee. It's kind of like when you pour milk into iced coffee and you get those little swirls and stuff like that. None of this was here when I wiped it down and suddenly you wipe it down, all those pores open up and you drop all that oil into it and you get just an absolutely gorgeous result. Look at all that. And the inlays are popping just a little bit there. So it's gonna get in there and kind of highlight the stuff. Just, I'm gonna do some slow motion or not some slow motion but some close up here really quickly some sexy sexy b-roll here because this is a gorgeous piece of rosewood i'm gonna get a little sentimental here for a second like i've told you guys about my my supplier mckinney hardwood lumber before um really nice guy his name's mike that uh does all of my or has supplied me throughout my guitar making journey I don't know how he finds these cuts of wood, but these are like, I just, they're, they're gorgeous. <laughs> That's all I can say is that these are gorgeous pieces of wood and I never expected to be able to work with materials like this in my career as a guitar builder. I am truly, truly blessed that like, not only does Mike have an amazing like selection of woods, but also that he's a local guy. Like you could go to Rockler or somewhere like that and get some of these cuts, but the fact that I can go in and like look at each of these and make a selection and say like, oh, I really like the figuring on this or on that. Like, I feel truly lucky as a luthier to be able, or as a beginning luthier to be able to have that privilege. And I don't think it's that one that uh, a lot of people get in this in this industry. And so I'm very, very thankful to Mike and um, McKinney Hardwood Lumber and just the opportunity that I have to be able to. and. Mike probably doesn't know that I'm saying this. He, I don't even know that. I've, I mean, I've told him that I build guitars and stuff like that, um, but he probably doesn't even know about the channel or anything like that. And it's just, he doesn't know that I'm doing this. I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart. And Mike's a really great guy. If you guys are ever looking for amazing cuts of lumber and amazing service, McKinney Hardwood Lumber, not sponsored or anything, just trying to put you guys onto a great local person. I mean, the cuts speak for themselves. Like So now to the issue of safety. We need to talk... You know, I joke around here and I make memes, boiled vinseed oil, all that good stuff, but I need to alert you guys to something here. On the very front, there's a warning. This can cause spontaneous combustion. If you don't know what spontaneous combustion is, well... It's been a little over three hours now, and suddenly we see flames. 
Linseed oil is an oil-based product. So that means that it is flammable to a certain extent. And in some cases it could be very, very highly flammable. So the last thing that you wanna do is take this rag and toss it into your bin. Remember that this is still, you know, a mixture and stuff like that. There's chemical reactions. Okay, let me move my fret looking block here. We have got a lot done today. Well, actually what you are watching in the span of just a couple minutes or maybe a half hour has culminated and taken me almost a couple months. So just between being busy with life and stuff like that and some other mechanics related stuff, I haven't really had a chance to sit down and I work on these things intermittently and so yeah, appreciate you guys sticking through the 30 minutes, even though for me it's been a little bit of a while. So I think this is a good place to stop. We just polished off the frets and got the frets installed, minus these ones up here. I don't have any fret wire that's long enough, so I just have to order some, but trust that that will get taken care of next episode. And I kind of want to break things up, kind of like what uh, Crimson Guitars does and stuff like that. Crimson does like multiple parts to each build and stuff like that. I'd like to keep it to two or three per build. But we've done everything here from rough mill to finishing to neck assembly and now fretboard assembly. And so the next step is just installing hardware, getting pickups wired up and all that good stuff. And some minor little things here and there. On the back here, you can see the set screws for the, the back neck are a little bit too long, even if I put a neck plate on there, which I will, so that I can put the serial number and all that good stuff on it. Um, even if I put the neck plate on there, then these would still stick out a little bit. So I've got to order some shorter screws. No big deal. Just one of those things. And just little things here and there that we probably need to do some touch up on. But I am very happy with how the frets came out on this one. They're absolutely gorgeous. They shine like white gold. And even as I'm looking at them under fluorescent light, I see a little bit of pitting on the frets and stuff like that. So I might have to go through and level them. But uh, other than that, 
I'm very happy with it. The fretboard feels good. It slides up and down. One of my big tests for a AI guitar is when you run your hand kind of along the edge here, you don't want it to get like nicked or you don't want any sort of stops here. And you, anyhow, I've rambled on long enough. So thank you guys so, so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for part two. We will get the electronics and stuff like that going and you won't want to miss it. Also, I think I'm going to do like a compilation or kind of just like an ASMR style build next time around because stopping and making these commentaries and stuff like that makes the the video go on for a little bit. But if it's one of those things that you guys are interested in that, definitely let me know. I'm thinking of doing like just a ASMR where you just hear the sounds of me assembling stuff and that sort of stuff, maybe some nice music. And then I'll do like a commentary track where I actually talk through what I'm going through. Or if you just guys, if, like I said, if you guys absolutely love like the stop and go kind of format of these where I talk and explain, then do let me know. I won't shy away from them. I just figure that with how much time you guys are giving me so far, um, I don't want to take any more of that than is necessary because time is precious. And I'm wiping down my fretboard as I say this. But uh, yeah, time is precious. And so <laughs> I'm thankful for any time that you guys can give me to watch me make crazy guitars. But of course, I don't want to take any more time than is absolutely necessary. And I'm sitting here rambling about time and taking up more time as we speak. So we'll cut it there. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. If you're interested in purchasing a guitar, you can find me on Instagram at as for drew or at Mad Lab. Instruments. And you can shoot me a DM, we can talk there. Um, I have a web shop in the process where I'm building up a storefront as well. So that may not be for a little bit, but uh, Point is, if you want to get a guitar, there's a way to get in contact with me, and I would be happy to build you a guitar. So, yeah, be good to one another, be excellent to one another, and party on. I'll see you guys in the next one.